All right, chapter one. Uh, chapter one in our advanced EMT book uh, starts the introductory or what is often referred to as the preparatory section uh, of the EMT course. A lot of this in this first section uh, is honestly going to be review. Uh, some of it is expanded upon a little more from your EMT class, uh, but uh, nonetheless, as much as it may seem um, it's kind of a boring topic, a lot of this base material that you get has to be ingrained in your practice um, on a daily basis. So it's a good foundational um, basis for mater of material to help you guide your practice for the future. So after we get through this uh, preparatory section, we we'll start getting into a little bit more in-depth stuff, such as uh, pathophysiology, pharmacology, and, and so on and so forth. So, but uh, we'll start with Chapter 1, which is Introduction to Advanced Emergency Medical Technician Practice. The education standard states that the student will be able to apply fundamental knowledge of the EMS system, safety, well-being of the AEMT, medical, legal, ethical issues to the provision of emergency care. We're going to see that uh, pop up again uh, probably for the next couple of chapters. The objectives, of course, are listed uh, on page one of your, or, I'm sorry, page two of your textbook. Um, and uh, it mostly has to do with some key terms, talks about some um, concepts such as scope of practice, roles and responsibilities, and um, key issues in the practice uh, of an AEMT. So AEMTs are a critical part of the emergency medical services system. Now AEMTs um, are a relatively new term, but not really a new concept. The previous midpoint, uh, if you will, between an EMT and a paramedic was an EMT intermediate. Uh, and there was a couple of those. There was the old EMT I-85 that was a uh, EMT that could start IVs and do some medication. The I-85 uh, started IVs and had a few advanced airway techniques. Um, and each state kind of uh, approached it differently whereas Nebraska allowed EMTI-85s to do endotracheal innovation, Iowa did not. Um, then, and, and when I say 1985, that's when that curriculum was introduced. In 1999, 98 and 99, uh, there was another revision of EMT National Standard Curriculum, and that brought about the EMTI-99. And the I-99 did really 95% of the things that a paramedic did, uh, only they didn't know why they did it. Um, they were not taught the pathophysiology behind it. They were not taught a lot of the theory. They were kind of robotic uh, providers where they simply, um, if this, do this, don't question it. So the AEMT actually kind of splits the difference. Um, not as many advanced invasive procedures that the I-99 did, but uh, there are more high value treatments than the I-85 did. So the AEMT, um, while it is still taking off, I think has a lot of promise for particularly the rural communities uh, that are still operating under uh, a solely volunteer system uh, because the paramedic has grown to be such a, a large educational opportunity or educational experience for people that it may not um, be something we can get many volunteers to do. So the AEMT kind of fills that gap. Um, they can kind of provide that link between the patients and the healthcare system and public health systems. So EMS systems uh, developed 
are developed to provide life-saving care uh, and emergency transport to critically ill and injured patients. That all sounds good and fine in the very, uh, you know, from a very sterile book approach. In reality, we're the link between home and the hospital for many patients. In greater than 90% of the time, they're not critically ill, nor are they critically injured. So, but that's originally why they were brought about, why EMS was invented and designed was because people were dying uh, outside the hospital because they weren't getting any care. So EMS providers uh, engage in community health education and promotion efforts and can work in a variety of settings. Um, there are institutions that are employing uh, EMS providers in the, their emergency departments and in other departments of their uh, facilities. There are certain um, dialysis clinics, for example, which are using uh, EMS providers. In some places throughout the United States, the school nurse has been replaced by a school EMT or paramedic uh, because EMTs and paramedics deal with emergencies, and that's you know, the reason why the nurses are there a lot. Um, you know, nurses in the school, uh, their, their school practice is just not very large. Uh, a lot of it relies on calling the parents and getting the parents to come and do a lot of things. And, you know, that's something an EMT can do. So EMS knowledge is defined by a number of documents published by NHTSA. Uh, if you're interested in these documents, uh, they're rather dry, but uh, they're the really the driving force behind many of the materials that you get. You can go to ems.gov which is a national NHTSA website, and look up education. Uh, education under there, you'll find these three documents, the core content, the scope of practice, the educational standards. You'll also find instructional guidelines for the respective levels. You'll find the old curriculums. So the 1984-1985 EMT paramedic curriculums. Uh, the 19, uh, I believe it was, um, 1995, I think, was the last first responder curriculum. So um, you can go back and look at old curriculums and see where to, where were we at and where are we headed to. Uh, it's kind of interesting to, to look that stuff over uh, and see where we've come. And, and it's exciting to look at where are we possibly going in the future. Um, EMS is going to be incorporated more and more and more into healthcare systems, more and more into um, the public health systems, we're kind of leaving some of our, we'll call them quote unquote roots with the fire department because the reason that the fire, fire department didn't want EMS, uh, fire service didn't want EMS originally when the, when the funeral homes were told you're getting out of the business because it's a conflict of interest, um, uh, fire didn't want EMS, uh, but uh, they got, uh, EMS kind of forced on them in many cases because they had trucks with red lights and sirens. And uh, that's what, what EMS needed, at least that's what they thought at the time. And uh, since that time, we've come to grow more to the healthcare side uh, and much further away from the public health side or from the uh, public safety side of things. So um, we'll never be completely away from public safety and completely in healthcare. Uh, I think neither side wants to fully uh, embrace us, uh, but we, we fill the gap. So talking about working in a variety of settings, um, there are courses now you can take to become a, a bicycle medic. Um, not that it changes your medicine a lot, it just changes your, your tactics and your response. Uh, there are so many different opportunities available to EMS providers these days, whether you're talking, um, you're on you're on the bike team. Um, when I was uh, just recently out in Denver, Colorado in their airport, uh, they have a guy on a little modified uh, utility vehicle, uh, kind of like, like a gator, if you will, uh, that drives around in the airport. He has all kinds of equipment on his truck. He's part of the Denver paramedics, and uh, he's the first responder for the entire Denver airport. So whether you're working in a hospital setting, um, maybe you're working in some other sort of clinical setting, 
schools, um, you know, there's and it goes on and on. Um, inter facility transports, critical care transports, tactical settings where you're working with fire. Oh, I'm sorry, with uh, SWAT teams, law enforcement SWAT teams. Um, maybe even wilderness. Um, you're working in the in a uh, in a national park. So there's there's lots and lots of potential. So the contemporary EMS profession, uh, we have the EMT oath and the EMT code of ethics, and they basically describe our professional conduct that's expected of, of EMS providers. You will find both of these in your textbook on pages four and five, uh, and I would highly, no, I, I'm going to ask that everybody read them. I'm not going to recommend it. I'm going to tell you to read these. Um, and, and granted, it, it alludes to EMT, but uh, EMT in this sense could be called EMS provider in these documents. So uh, when many of them were written, uh, EMT was about all there was. There wasn't an immediate and AEMTs, and and even the paramedic was was just an, in its infancy. So you are a professional. I don't care if you take home a paycheck for this or not. Most of the progressive leaders within the EMS community feel exactly the same way. Um, it doesn't matter whether you take home a paycheck or not. For what you do, you are a professional. It's just whether you've chosen to make it a career or just continue to make it a, a passion and a hobby. So you are held to a higher standard. In fact, there have been numerous polls done of the public an EMS professional, EMTs and paramedics, um, are routinely in the top three most respected professions within the United States. So uh, that being said, you have to now remember you are definitely in the spotlight. Uh, everybody in your communities that you work, work in, particularly the smaller communities, um, knows who the ambulance people are. They know who the EMTs are. So you're in the spotlight. You got to be aware that your activities, your agendas of major EMS state, national organizations, and which direction EMS is headed. Um, you should be a member of the Iowa EMS Association, or IEMSA. Um, and you should strongly consider becoming a member of NEMSA. I'm sorry, not NEMSA, uh, NAEMT, the National Association of EMTs. Um, if you're nationally registered as an EMT currently, and eventually will be as an AEMT, uh, that's another professional affiliation you're involved with. And then you need to pay attention. As news in the EMS world comes around, it, it can affect you. Um, there are a number of, of providers that fought very diligently against changing to the new national standards that uh, Iowa and Nebraska both have adopted. And uh, they fought tooth and nail because they thought it was the wrong thing. They were the minority. The majority of people thought, yes, this is the right thing, try to get everybody on the same sheet of music. But if you're not aware of what's going on and you're not paying attention to what's going on around you, you're going to get left in the dust. So there's your think about it question. It refers back to your uh, case study on the beginning of the chapter. I'll let you guys uh, handle that. So EMS provider levels. We currently have four recognized EMS provider levels in the United States. Uh, it was their intent to clean this up. Prior to the new national scope of practice that came out, um, which is, holy cow, that's got to be 15 years old almost, um, there was 47 different levels of EMS provider in the United States. 47. And that was a minimum. There was probably more than that. Um, depending on whatever they were allowed to do and whatever they were called. So in one state you might have been a cardiac technician, in another you might have been a mobile intensive care paramedic, you might have been a mobile intensive care tech, you might be a, you know, there was all kinds of different steps. You know, even Iowa and Nebraska with their EMTIs prior to the advent of the I-99, an I-85 in Nebraska intubated, I-85 in Iowa did not. So there was a, there was a big flaw with that current system. Um, there was no reciprocity. 
and the reciprocity was very difficult for you to go from state A to state B because nobody's standards were the same. So they've gone and developed the basement standard is the same. So everybody is expected to be trained to the basic EMR, EMT, AMT standard, and then the states have the opportunity to then expand upon it, preferably after they become licensed. So they may be able to tack on an endorsement for you to do more stuff. So our four nationally recognized levels currently are the emergency medical responder, the emergency medical technician, the advanced emergency medical technician, and the paramedic. So EMRs uh, train in very basic skills. Um, they use minimal equipment. They have basic first aid measures. They can do some of the life, uh, critically life-saving uh, techniques, CPRs, AEDs, uh, some airway management items, bleeding control, shock management. Um, and they perform very simple assessments just to help them identify and manage life threats. While this isn't a completely true statement, uh, if you think about it this way, think about EMRs do the primary assessment to uh, identify and treat the life threats because that's the purpose of the, of the primary assessment. They do do a little more beyond that, but uh, think of it as, as kind of that, that model. EMRs also can use basic airway management things such as uh, oral airways. They can do ventilation with a bag valve mask, CPR, AED, of course. Um, and can meth methods of bleeding control. Um, they're trained to recognize injuries and illness that are injuries that require mobilization, although in most places they do not immobilize unless they've had some tacked on uh, additional. Training is roughly 48 to 60 hours depending on the organization offering it. Some states probably do have a minimum number of hours. Um, a lot of states do not. They've really said it's up to the training agency or training program to design the curriculum and then um, implement that so they can meet the standards and the requirements. So it's, uh, it, it's not a cut and dry 48 hours or 50 hours or 60 hours. It used to be that the EMT class was 110 hours. And that was it. The original EMT class was 81 hours. Um, and slowly that's grown because there's just more expected out of an EMT. Emergency medical technicians or EMTs, uh, they provide emergency medical care and transport. That's the key there is transport. Um, now granted, I'll, I'll give you an example um, of where a state has uh, raised the bar a little bit post-education. In Nebraska, an EMR, after they're licensed and have taken and completed the National Registry, can go on and take an additional course that will allow them to transport patients in rare situations. So in, if you went strictly by uh, national standard, that would be a no-no. But they, we recognize in Nebraska that occasionally an EMT just might not show up. And if that EMT doesn't show up and there's EMRs there, they could begin transport and do a tiered response with another agency to provide EMT care. So uh, a kind of an interesting uh, concept that, that we've kind of picked up on. Uh, but uh, there's, there's, there's some states that have gotten some creative things they've done. Uh, EMTs also use basic equipment supplied on a standard ambulance. They play a large variety of roles in EMS systems. Uh, in some systems, you have to be an EMT simply to drive. Um, there are some places that it's a, a paramedic EMT team. The EMT assists on scene while uh, they're uh, prior to transport, but the EMT always drives. Some places, EMTs is the top. Um, some places EMTs are a rarity. Uh, again, I've mentioned school EMTs and whatnot. A lot of times they also act in a first response capacity. Most, we'll call them tiered systems, um, say for example a fire department um, that has uh, a, a career fire department where a fire 
truck, an engine, or an aerial company responds with the squad. Uh, most places uh, in the metro areas, for example, uh, there is not an ambulance in every uh, fire station. There may be ambulances only in about half of them. And the engine company or the aerial company responds and uh, starts care. And those people are almost always EMTs. Um, well, for example, the Omaha Fire Department. In order for you to be field staff with the Omaha Fire Department, you have to be an EMT, period. Um, and then they can, EMTs obviously provide immediately life-saving care. Uh, they can provide primary transport. Um, they can work in the community. They can work on ambulances. They may partner at the same level or work up. Um, they do assessments. And training takes roughly 150 to 190 hours now. And that includes um, a clinical field experience depending on the state. Um, so that includes that in there. Um, yes, it's grown a little bit from the 81 hour days. So advanced EMTs, this is where you guys are all hoping to be. Uh, obviously all the skills of the EMR and the e in the EMT and a limited number of ALS interventions uh, such as initiating IVs, um, some other blind airways beyond that of the king. Um, so basically the dual airway, dual lumen airway such as a combi tube, uh, some tracheal uh, bronchial suctioning, uh, some IOs, and a, a number of medications. So they have to practice when the scope of practice approved by the state and the EMS service medical director. We'll talk more about scope of practice eventually. Um, advanced EMTs must either have completed an EMT training or it must be incorporated into the program. So in most states, EMT uh, is a prerequisite to advanced EMT. Uh, there, I don't think many states have jumped on board saying, we're going to let you go from uh, nobody to AEMT um, straight, straight through. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's always going to be that way. I think there's the potential for people to uh, skip EMT and go directly to AEMT. Uh, the training requires 150 to 250 hours beyond that of the EMT training. And included in that time, of course, is your clinical field. So, uh, in fact, at least half of that is probably pretty close to clinical field. And then you have paramedics. Um, <clears throat> paramedics, uh, allied healthcare professional who provide complex assessment and interventions for critical and emergent patients. They have a complex understanding of anatomy, physiology, pathophys, treatment modalities. We're going to just start to dabble a little bit into those concepts uh, in this course. Uh, paramedics uh, take it to the nth degree. Uh, paramedic education is, is no longer about cookbook medicine. It's all about evidence-based. So, education programs. Um, are often based in institutions of higher education. So almost uh, all, not not all, but almost all, are now affiliated with a college of some way, shape, or form. Um, and then the, there's a uh, body called the Commission on the Accreditation of EMS Programs, or EMS Education Programs, uh, that accredits paramedic education programs. If you decide to go on to paramedic, you have to graduate from a COA EMSP accredited program or you are not eligible to take the national registry. And, all, and 46 of the 50 states require national registry for initial licensure. So it behooves you to go to a COA accredited program. Programs range from 1,000, uh, I think 1,500 hours is pretty low, um, probably 1,000 to 2,000 or 1,000 to 2,500 beyond that of the EMT level. So it's, it's an intense education. Uh, it's no longer a couple nights a week sitting around the fire station and um, you know, chewing the fat. Uh, paramedic education become an education. And a lot of them require more than just going to paramedic class. They require going to AMP, maybe English, math, and, and social sciences of some sort. Um, so there's more to it. So uh, here's another, um, I'll think about it for us. Uh, a, a tour bus motor vehicle crash has, uh, or collision has occurred in our jurisdiction. 
resulting in multiple injuries and possible fatalities, and what levels of EMS responders are likely to be on scene. And then, of course, remembering that these responders must work together. That's really something that I think you should focus your attention on for your local community because it's going to be different from every location. So before I move on, uh, we'll talk, uh, I'll, I'll brush you up on some terminology change. Um, the EMR formerly was known as the first responder. The EMT was formerly known as the EMT basic. Of course, the advanced levels were the EMT intermediate um, prior to the AEMT, and that was either an intermediate 85 or 99. And then the paramedic used to have EMT in front of it, so it used to be EMT paramedics. Um, the terminology has changed, and in most states, um, they've adopted the new titles, they've adopted the new nomenclature. Um, so while it is going to be a tough habit to break, you've got to remember that uh, uh, a title has a certain meaning behind it, and if we use them lightly, um, there can create some confusion. So, roles and responsibilities of the AEMT. So, what are what are what is really a lot of your job? Um, so, we obviously have uh, a huge number of tasks that we have to uh, consider every day. Um, the example they're showing here in in the book, or I'm sorry, on the screen, is uh, you know, checking to make sure your vehicle is ready to go, um, and and that's that's really so critical because um, if we're not ready to roll uh, and something happens, who's to blame? It's the people who rolled out uh, and who were the ones that uh, were ill-prepared to respond to this call. Additionally, uh, each state uh, defines the scope of practice uh, of their licensed EMS personnel, uh, and that scope of practice is the ceiling for what an EMT or an AEMT or paramedic or EMR does, so that your physician medical director cannot, in most cases, extend privileges and say, well, I don't care what the state says, I want you guys to do this, um, they, because by law, they're not allowed to do that. Um, so working within your scope of practice, of course, is your responsibility. Um, off of standing orders uh, or verbal orders, protocols, those sorts of things, that's what we commonly think of as what we do. But there's so much more to it than that. Uh, being ready to respond. Is the vehicle in, in good repair? Has it been checked out? Do we have the appropriate supplies? Do we have, um, you know, charged batteries in our monitor? Do we have a, you know, a suction canister in our portable suction? Safety. Of course, safety continues to pop up in probably every chapter in this textbook. But safety, we're responsible for our own safety, our coworkers, our patients, and then finally others. So it's kind of everyone for themselves initially, and once we're safe, we extend that on to then our coworkers, our patients, and then bystanders and others. Uh, it's important that we adhere to safe practices when administering medication or any other treatment for that matter. Medications tend to have a, a few more potential side effects, but that's not to say that doing a spinal immobilization isn't potentially dangerous to our patients as well. Uh, we've got to be aware of um, ourselves when we're driving an emergency vehicle. whether we're operating that motor vehicle with the lights and sirens on, or we are uh, you know, operating in just standard traffic mode. Uh, there's a huge number of medical errors per year, traffic crashes per year that end up killing patients, killing providers, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, killing uh, innocent bystanders. So safety has to remain our top priority and concern. Teamwork. Obviously, we have to be involved with teamwork. We have to work with other people. Um, I like to joke, why do they call them paramedics? Because they come in pairs. Um, well, that's not exactly true all the time, but uh, it, it illustrates the point. We don't do it alone. In fact, EMS is not just an ambulance. EMS includes 
bystanders and lay people doing something, dispatchers, first responders, um, EMRs, EMTs, all the way up through paramedics, helicopters, fire trucks of firefighters showing up and helping, emergency rooms are all a part of EMS. So this is a bigger picture. It's not just us. And it's tough in this role uh, or the role model that we had uh, for designing our systems often was a turf war. Uh, we, we mimicked a lot of the turf wars that some of our uh, cohorts had. Don't cross the street. This is our district and that's your district. You stay out of our district or we're going to fight. And sometimes it actually did come down to that. There were actually fist fights when somebody crossed into somebody else's district to do something. Um, sad. It's very sad. But teamwork is critical. We don't have the teamwork. We're not going to get the job done. Um, imagine trying to work a cardiac arrest and drive the patient to the hospital all by yourself. Scene leadership, management, and teamwork. If you're an AEMT, it's very possible that you are going to be the highest level provider on that truck. So you are going to be the leader. And uh, it's critical that you have decent leadership skills. You need to be able to delegate. You need to be able to critically think and manage this scene. You've got to be confident and in control. It doesn't say you always have to know exactly what's going on. It's nice if you do, but I've done this job for dang near 25 years. And there are still patients that I respond to that when I drop them off at the hospital, I just don't have any clue what's wrong with them. It just happens. So we don't always have all the answers, all the tools we need uh, to get the definitive final answer. <clears throat> we have to be empathetic. It doesn't mean sympathetic. It means we're hearing them out. We are uh, have to attend to emotional needs of our patients and our family members. And a lot of times the emotional needs uh, outweigh the actual physical needs. We have to perform a, a decent patient assessment, uh, a good patient assessment. That's the most important tool in our toolbox. Um, provide care based off of our findings and then provide a safe transport uh, to get them entered into the healthcare system. We have patient management and assessment priorities and responsibilities. Uh, the ability to assess and manage patients with our variety of illnesses, from minor to critical, understanding that a lot of our patients really don't have significant problems. Uh, they may have problems. They may not have significant, uh, immediately life-threatening issues. You've got to be aware of the most current trends and practices in EMS. And unless you've been uh, completely sheltered in the EMS world recently, you'll know there's a lot of discussion on whether or not we should be spinal immobilizing everybody. Um, and in fact, there's a significant amount of data that says we way over immobilize people. We put too many collars and backboards on people. Um, so that's a hot topic. It's not become the standard of, of care yet that we don't immobilize all these people, but there's good research that's supporting that we're going to probably change our, our standards. So you got to be aware. Read the journals. Get on the website, gems.com, emsworld.com. Uh, both of those are print magazines that you can get online and, and just kind of peruse what they've got. You can get them in electronic format. You can get them in the print format. Um, pay attention to those things. Go to conferences. Go to Con Ed classes and stay up to date. And then be willing to discard outdated knowledge and practice to add new ones. Any of us that have been around the EMS world for very long know that the mask pants or the, the PASG um, are constantly wavering back and forth. They're great, they're bad. They're great, they're bad. They're great, they're bad. Um, so we have to be ready to say, well, maybe what we were doing wasn't quite right. The reality of, of medicine was we haven't always done things in medicine that were actually proven or even based in science. There are some drugs that we've given along the, the years 
that we gave it because it seemed to make sense and oh well it probably should work uh, and it kind of became the standard. Maybe it worked you know, one out of a hundred times but somebody was like yes this works, this works. Um, and so we have to say occasionally yeah what we did for so long wasn't right, wasn't good, we got to change it. You have a role and responsibility to maintain your certification or license. You cannot practice as an EMT or an advanced EMT or paramedic, whatever, EMS professional without the appropriate state certification or licensure. When you get done with this class, you will get a certificate of completion for your course. What that basically says is you are a card carrying CPR provider and actually you'll still already be EMTs, so you'll be able to do EMT stuff. You cannot do any AEMT stuff when you graduate from this course until you have a license or certification from the state that says you can do so. The National Registry of EMTs is not a license or certification to practice. You will complete a course. You get a certificate of completion. You will then be eligible to take the National Registry, which will give you a registration or you'll be placed on a list that says you passed a test. And then the state will have the option to give you a certification or a license so you can actually practice. And even then, you don't get to practice until you're on a service and a medical director has says you may practice. So there is there are multiple steps here to being able to do this. Maintaining your license or your certification. There are continuing ed requirements um, for all levels of EMS providers. Uh, you have to know what your requirements are. And National Registry does not match most state requirements. Most state requirements are less than those of the National Registry. Do not wait until one month before your expiration date to decide to start doing continuing education. Uh, as I record this lecture, we're in December. Uh, and in Nebraska, um, where uh, I work mostly, EMTs expire. December 31st of odd numbered years and with it being the first week of December I've been getting phone calls like mad because people are all of a sudden deciding oh I better start getting some continuing education. That is not the professional approach to this. The professional approach to this is you've done this all along um, and in December and actually October when the notices come out uh, for Nebraska or it'll be uh, roughly January when they come out in Iowa that's when you go back and say okay let's just make sure I got everything covered and then log in hit submit do your thing and bam you got you get your license uh, not waiting to the last minute um, and surprisingly it happens a lot so know what the requirements are from the day that your license shows up in the mail read the stuff that comes with it and start following up get your mandatory continuing education both Iowa and the National Registry have required topics you have to touch. You have to, to make sure you have enough hours. You may have to do some sort of a verification of your skills. Your medical director may have to sign you off. You have to keep up your CPR. There may be a fee you have to pay. That's not all something that you should wait until um, you know the, the 11th hour to do. I literally, when I was program director in Iowa, uh, at, at Iowa Western, um, had a patient, or not patient, a provider call me, and in Iowa, people, um, everybody but EMRs expires March 31st of either, you know, one year or another. I had a gentleman call me at 4.30 in the afternoon on March 31st one year, and he needed four hours of continuing education before midnight for him to maintain his license or he was going to expire, and he wanted to know just what the heck I was going to do about it. Um, and um, I, to be quite honest with you, I told him there's not a dang thing I'm going to do about it because this has been your responsibility for the last two years to get this done. There are no classes scheduled. We don't do classes for single people. I'm sorry. So stay up to date on it. Continuously be gathering these things. And there's a lot of opportunities if you just keep your eyes open. We have to work with other health care providers. We have to work with other public safety providers. We have to have a good relationship with law enforcement because um, they're the ones that are going to protect you. They have guns. Okay, We don't. Um, 
healthcare providers. They're the ones that are taking over the patient care. They're the ones that need the information so they can continue to help this patient get better. We are in this for the patient's well-being, and therefore, if we can't work with others that are can continue that, um, we're probably not in the right field. So whether we're talking EMS, we might be talking fire, we might be talking law enforcement, health care, maintain cooperative professional relationships. Uh, an example is, um, yes, uh, we had a, uh, I know of a volunteer service that decided they were going to transport a patient to a hospital recently. Uh, they called the hospital to give a report. The hospital told them, you have to divert. Um, we are overflowing with patients. We have no room for the patient. Uh, go to the next nearest hospital. And uh, that ambulance chose to ignore that uh, request. And the hospital can close, and they can tell you to divert because if there's nobody to take care of patients and no beds to put them in, go to the next one. Um, but uh, they chose to ignore that and just showed up at their door and dropped this patient off and says, well, we brought you this patient, and we think they're having a stroke, so you guys better get in here and do something about it. Um, that You can't do that. You cannot do that. The hospital is closed. It's essentially told you that they are not accepting patients, and it is not right for the patient. They refused to go to another facility because this was the closest hospital, and they all wanted to get back to whatever they were doing. And um, that, that service is going to be in trouble. Those providers are going to be in trouble because they defied an order. So maintain cooperative relationships. They're the ones that are going to help you out uh, when you get in a pinch. All right. Other advanced EMT professional characteristics. Uh, you're going to be defined by the expectations of the public. A lot of people think, well, I just define myself. It doesn't matter. Um, you you got to be realistic, and you have to look at what is it that we are uh, judged on? So our appearance. Who is the majority of the patients that EMS deals with? The elderly population. And what do the elderly populations think about all this free expression? Um, you know, it is my right to show off whatever I want to do and poke a hole in whatever I want and ink up whatever I want. The elderly don't have a good feeling for that. Um, now right or wrong, our general public, our general population that uses our services the most doesn't care for that. So conservative is the way we have to be. Um, you certainly can be your own person when you are completely off duty, although remember, people know who you are. You're never completely off duty in their mind. So you have to take that into consideration. The professional group itself, um, you know, it, 30, 40 years ago, it maybe was appropriate, or not appropriate, never was appropriate, maybe was accepted that the pager went off, you got up off your bar stool in the bar, and you ran across the street and jumped in the fire truck, and away you went. And in some agencies today, they may still think that that's an acceptable standard. It is not. Uh, our profession, the NAEMT, the uh, IMSA, uh, all those other professional bodies have said no, absolutely not. Even the IAFF has come out and said no. Uh, this is not acceptable. This is not how a professional acts. Um, other related professional groups, if we're constantly the one that's pissing off somebody else, uh, that's going to taint their view of our profession in, as a whole, not just our you as a person or your department. And the most visible way that patients and families can judge you is through your interactions. So if you show up on a scene and that patient has no medical knowledge, which most of our patients have limited to no medical knowledge, what is that patient going to remember from your interaction? Are they going to remember that you took an extra 10 seconds to put on a splint, uh, or you had to change out the suction catheter, they're not going to remember that. They're going to remember the way that you made them feel. Did you, were you respectful to them? Did you comfort them? 
Um, that's what they know. They know how they were treated. They may not know the specifics of, of the uh, um, treatment that you did, but they know how you made them feel as a person. So that doesn't mean that you can be an incompetent twit and uh, not know how to use your suction or your vacuum splinter or whatever. Um, you still have to know that. The patient just may not realize that. Define each term as listed below, integrity, empathy, and self-motivation. Integrity encompasses your behaviors of honesty, honor, reliability, and being upstander, uh, are upstanding. A lot of these things that people would call the Boy Scout, okay? um, whereas the, uh, you know, you're expected to be uh, honest and truthful, you do everything correctly, accurately, um, and everything, uh, people can trust you. Empathy means showing compassion and understanding. So this is relation with relating to patients, relating to other providers, relating to family members. And then self-motivation means that you know that things need to be done and you get them done. You have an initiative to do them. You don't have to be told to. My best partners I've ever worked with, I never had to tell them to do a single thing. After working with them a few times, they just knew and they did it. So self-motivation, not to mention, there's not always somebody standing above us in EMS cracking the whip telling us, do this, do that. A lot of times we have to do it on our own. Appearance and demeanor are critical elements of professionalism. We are going to be judged on those sorts of things. Do you come to work clean? Do you come to work presentable? Is your shirt wrinkled? Um, is your uh, you know pants ripped out? Do you have uh, um, you know, body odors? Are you unshaven? Those are all things that people are going to go, what? This just isn't look right. Is it right to judge them off of their appearance specifically? Uh, no, it's probably not. But most people, it's easier said than done that your immediate reaction in looking at somebody instantly kind of taints the interaction. So remember those things. Um, be be your uh, be your own person, your fun, exciting person outside of work. Not wearing your uniform. Do not you know get off work at the ambulance service or get off of the call and run down in your coat and shirt and whatever and sit at the bar and drink all night. Change your clothes. Okay, it helps protect the profession. Why do we wear uniforms? Well, we are in a, a pseudo-military organization, basically. We have uh, uh, kind of rigid standards. We have um, you know, specific expectations. Uh, and we are in a position of authority. So oftentimes, the uniform helps support that. Not to mention, we're easier to identify that we're the ones that are supposed to be there. Now, granted, when we, we put the volunteer spin on this, um, it may not be as easy to have uh, people look um, spit-shined all the time because they maybe are coming from their job and maybe they work outside. Maybe they work, uh, you know, with, uh, on, maybe they're a mechanic. I mean, there's all kinds of maybes and what-ifs that get thrown in there. There are opportunities to throw uh, a coat over or a jacket or a vest or something that kind of helps clean it up, kind of uh, bring the presentation together. You know, and if you're wearing your you may be a mechanic, um, but if you're wearing your gloves, hopefully they're not going to see that your hands are all filthy. So, so a couple other terms there: self-confident versus uh, self-confidence. Um, self-confidence. <laughs> Being self-confident uh, means that you have a reasonable, realistic faith in your ability, whereas self-confidence is displayed through your poise, your calm, and your control. They roll together. They really do. They roll together. This is basically putting on that, uh, you, you put on your, your Superman suit, and uh, you become, um, you're ready to go. You're ready to take the, the world by the horns, and you have faith in yourself that you can do this as well. So who do AEMTs communicate with? Anybody that's potentially going to be in this chain. We're going to communicate with dispatchers. We're going to communicate with um, 
firefighters, work law enforcement, other EMS providers, other healthcare providers, patients, family members, bystanders, so many things that we're potentially going to be communicating with. Um, good, why is good communication required? It is an absolute must. If we can't get our message across or we can't understand somebody else's message, something gets lost and we're led down the wrong trail. And then what does good time management mean? So good time management means that we know when it's time to go, when it's time to get our stuff done, and move to the next step. Uh, prioritize what we need to get done. Sometimes, you know, we know, oh, this patient has been thrown out of a car, but look at their broken arm. I really have to splint that. They're unconscious, they're not breathing well, but oh, I've got to splint that before we can go. No, no. Good time management says this patient needs a surgeon's knife. And even though that patient has a broken arm, we can splint that, quote unquote, with a backboard. Uh, get them loaded, get them to the hospital. Their broken arm will be, get fixed later. We need to worry about that leaking aorta in the middle of their chest. Teamwork, diplomacy, and respect. Um, completing that call with feeling uh, of great teamwork allows things to go smoothly. And uh, teamwork requires us to all have a common goal in mind and all work to achieve that goal. Uh, hopefully, uh, that teamwork is built over time uh, through the process of respect. So regard of, of an innate value of others. Uh, if you respect those that you work with, you maybe aren't best friends with them, but you can respect that they do a good job and what they do um, can help to build that teamwork. And diplomacy. Uh, is required for effective communication and teamwork. Being tactful. Again, you maybe don't like the person you're working with or you're on the truck with, but because you're able to put the difference aside and see that each of us are a professional and um, you do a good job at what you do uh, and uh, or when you do something maybe I don't trust or don't like, I can come up to you and we can discuss it civilly later. Maybe it's not the appropriate time on the call to do that. But. Patient advocacy and careful delivery of service. So patient advocacy, we are keeping the patient in the forefront of our mind when we're making decisions. So somebody calls, uh, wants us to help them, uh, that's what we're doing. We're going to help them. Uh, maybe uh, you're not supposed, maybe uh, part of your job doesn't include helping somebody go to the bathroom. Uh, but we roll them into that ER that's packed, um, or we take them into the nursing home and we're waiting on the nurse to come get them uh, or come get a report from us and take over care after they come back from the ER. Um, what's the best thing for the patient? They call us, tell us, I, need, I really need to go to the bathroom. No, that's not the empty scope of practice, but honestly, is it going to be that difficult to assist them? So that's patient advocacy. Maybe it's deciding, well, um, I have to make a decision on where to transport. I could transport to hospital A or I could transport to hospital B which is five minutes farther out. Um, I really am at the end of my shift and I need to get off and get out of here but this patient really needs the services at hospital B and that patient advocacy is saying I need to take them to the appropriate facility. Your careful delivery service again is your, it's your professional character. Make sure that everything is ready to go and you're able to provide the base best patient care possible um, and uh, then everything is is prepared and you're able to to perform to your uh, maximum abilities so in summary AMT is obviously an essential part of the EMS and healthcare system uh, and the public health system for that matter and AEMTs um, are professionals who are held to a very high expectation.